All right, folks, we are joined by Karen Carroll of the Public Health Department and for the City of Gloucester and Jim Destino, the Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Gloucester. Thank you both for joining us. We want to get to right here. into the imminent uh, reopening uh, as we uh, wait for Governor Baker's word on the 18th. Uh, so would either of you like to start us off with how um, you've been uh, preparing uh, for this uh, announcement or decision? Uh, well, why don't I just start with a the little bit of context. I just got off the our one of our weekly calls with the Department of Public Health. And again, just we really need to remind people that Monday isn't going to be a floodgate opening. Um, what they said to us is there will be very restricted, controlled opening. So, um, and they sort of said it will get messier first because there'll be a lot of rules around very specific things that can open and how much they can open. Um, but there will really be, they were really reiterating that message to us that we, we can't expect the floodgates to open and that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, I think also with Memorial Day coming and nice weather, we really need to manage that. Or um, They've also said that we're not likely to see more than 10 people still. Uh, that recommendation won't change on Monday or next week. Um, so these are all the messages and the kind of what we have to work through the context um, for our reopening group. So with that in mind, I mean, that was one of the major purposes of the reopening task force was to help businesses and the community manage the expectations as we go through the summer um, and things change and, and we can operate a little bit differently as we move forward. So yeah, so that's the context, but um, Jim can tell you a little bit about how we've structured it in the city and the different subcommittees we've set up. Sure, so as Karen said, I mean, this is all against the backdrop of doing it safe safely and making sure that we can you know reopen the you know the, the economy um, um, you know with, with the proper health protocols and people uh, maintaining you know the the, the uh, st strategy that we have and the governor uh, the governor will have put in place on Monday so basically we put a group together that was taught wanted to you know get best ideas best practices uh, involve the public and we've set up a, a task force. We have 13 members on that task force. They're, they're really a great group. Um, a lot of folks are some city managers, um, some people from the private sector, obviously uh, some, some folks from the, you know, the health uh, industry. And down through that, we put up seven subcommittees and those subcommittees are, you know, the business groups, which is really a large group that encompasses, you know, retail and manufacturing, office, the harbor, those types of industries. And then we have a tourism, you know, it's looking at lodging and arts and theater and, you know, water, recreational activities like whale watching. And then we had the food establishments and bars. Uh, that's the um, subcommittee that I ch uh, chair. Uh, recreational and open spaces, special populations, homeless and uh, substance abuse, group homes. Um, and then we have one uh, subcommittee on group, uh, group uh, youth for um, sports and, and camps and recreational uh, summer activities and schools. And, last, and lastly, we have um, one for cultural, religious and private social events. I mean, as you, as you can realize, you know, folks have had a tough time during all this, um, you know, this nightmare with uh, people, you know, getting sick and, and unfortunately, you know, passing away, but, you know, people can't get together for funerals. So we put a group together as well to, uh, to address those, um, some of these needs. And we're really looking for public input, you know, to ensure that we get local ideas, concerns and, and questions are answered. And so that we could push that up to, to our task force, our local task force, and, and make sound public policy to, to safely reopen the city. Jim, where are you getting the, and Karen, where are you getting the guidelines for how to proceed? Well, I mean, there is so much information out there, um, you know, you know, and so there's some research which is involved for all the committee members and the subcommittee members. Um, I mean, as you know, just watching, you know, the news or reading online, there's endless amounts of data out there. Um, and, you know, so we start there, but we also, 
you know, we're listening to, you know, the state health um, experts as well as our local board of health um, on, you know, best practices. Um, and, and, and again, it has to, we still have to customize that uniquely to our city. So um, there's a lot of information is around what other cities are doing, what other states are doing, what other countries have done. And, you know, we want to include that into our program because, you know, we have to think about this regionally as well. I mean, if Gloucester does something different than Essex and Rockport and, and Manchester, I mean, it, it could affect them. So you'd really have to think about this big picture wise as, as we really focus, you know, you know, mainly on the city. So are you hoping that Governor Baker provides sort of very specific guidelines on what a restaurant has to do and exactly what the parameters are there or what, um, you know, what the boating world has to do to really proceed with the whale watching industry? Are you hoping that the governor will provide, provide more specific information? Uh, again, we, we, we spend a lot of time on state meetings. I do, um, especially with the C CEO meetings with the governor and the, um, and the uh, lieutenant governor. And we've implored them to be, have as much specificity as possible with these guidelines because, um, and they have listened to that. I believe that you will see specific guidelines on, on a lot of different sectors, business sectors, and how that will be handled. I think they've really got a good team up there. Uh, one of our uh, our own at the DPW is serving on the uh, beach committee. The um, Joe, Joe Lacido is serving on the subcommittee for open space and beaches. Um, so yeah, I believe they will be specific. And, and again, I think that's key to success for, to making folks understand what the expectations are and you know following the rules. I, I, I really believe that um, uh, the governor's office is going to do a thorough job, I, and I'm looking forward to you know whatever comes out of Monday. Yeah, I, I would agree with that too. I think we're going to get a lot of really detailed um, advice and guidance. Um, but then there's then there's always just that step of so you know you're told how many times an hour you need to wipe down your public restrooms and but it's all those logistics who will do it how where do they get the hand sanitizer the PPE they might need what's the appropriate level of PPE um, what signage do they need what training so there's all of those kinds of issues and and that's where the task force is trying to anticipate. Um, some of the things that we know people will need reopening and then what kind of training and how we can support people. So um, Jim and I talked yesterday about doing some videos um, on, you know, some infection control stuff that every business is really going to have to understand in a way that they never used to. Um, well, not ne not all of them. I mean, I think the restaurant and the food handlers have always had been expected to do a certain level of training, um, and they're pretty used to a lot of this, but it's even going to go a little further. And so that's where our team and we'll be trying to support our businesses locally, figure out the guidance will say you have to have your table six feet apart. Well, how can they do that in Destino's or in a smaller restaurant? Um, so th those are some of the, the things that we hope that the reopening task force will do. And it will um, help people come together and kind of creatively problem solve. And we've already seen a little bit of that. You know, here's what I heard or here's what we're going to try or we're going to set some stuff up outside or we might look at using our parking lot like they did in New Hampshire for some tables. So there's a lot of creative ways that people are trying to move forward. Um, we have an infection control person on our reopening committee from the local hospital who's fabulous and she's giving us guidance um, on some of the more technical areas that do need that level of detail. Um, and we also have the public health students that the governor has set up. There are students and professors from local public health schools who are available to us and they have been phenomenal. We fire them a question, what's the safest youth sport and how do you how do you modify it to get kids playing? And within 24 hours, we're getting a really nice report back where they scan kind of the internet, best practice, the research and give us some guidelines. So we're really lucky to have that and we're taking advantage of that as well. Uh, but a lot of it now is helping our, our local agencies and businesses take the guidance and say, okay, what does it mean in my shop or my business? 
And how about, I know we talked before about the contact tracing efforts and testing efforts, and so much of this is dependent upon those numbers going down or certain numbers. <laughs> Can you talk about what, yeah. where we're at there? Yeah, I mean, we continue to see a decline locally in all, many of those key indicators. So for two weeks or now, I feel pretty confident that we have seen this decline that you wanted to see for two weeks in hospitalizations, deaths, and the, the rate of positive tests is staying pretty stably at 11 to 12, 13%. So those are good indicators. Um, but again, Massachusetts is one of the fourth or fifth top nation in terms of the impact of COVID. We've had the most deaths, the most hospitalizations. I'm not sure why, but we've, we've been hit really hard in this state. And so we need to be even more careful than other states as we open up. I think our governor is really mindful of that. And, and again, we need to help the public understand that, that we are kind of at a higher risk because of where we started. We have a lot of community transmission in many of our counties, um, but the community tracing will continue and we will ramp it up. Um, the state has also ramped up the testing and it's expanded criteria for who can get tested. So as soon as we have a positive, anybody who's determined to be a close contact by a board of health, those people will be eligible for testing and will be advised, recommended to get testing immediately. Um, unfortunately, we don't have test sites right here on Cape Ann yet, um, but we do have Beverly and Danvers, and we will facilitate people getting to those sites if they need to. But that's the hope is that we can really quickly identify positive cases, people who are symptomatic, uh, maybe even before they're symptomatic, we get people diagnosed and, and isolated for however long they need to be um, so they're not infecting others. And I feel confident that we have the tracing and now we're getting the testing. I'd like to have a little more testing right here locally in Gloucester and Cape Ann, um, but we do have test sites and it's and now it's training physicians and primary care to, to test this new group of people that in the past they haven't. So we're finding that's another um, learning process that everybody has to go through. Uh, but our nurses will, will work on that, and that's a good thing for quickly isolating and keeping businesses reopening, reopened. Jim, I want to add that um, we're expecting, of course, people are itching to get out of their homes and try to re return to some sort of normalcy. But you couple whatever Monday's announcement is with the fact that we may see tourists starting to find their way back to our, this destination area, and how is the city bracing itself uh, to deal with outsiders as well? Well, you know, the rules are gonna apply for to everyone, um, you know, visitors to Gloucester and residents of Gloucester. And I, you know, and it's key to, to make folks understand really that, you know, it's up to you, to you know, the personal responsibility. I mean, Gloucester, I mean, you know, as Massachusetts has hit pretty hard, Gloucester has done relatively, relatively okay during this pandemic. I mean, we've had some clusters, we've had some, but if you look just a little bit further down the line, you know, there's, there's some major numbers that we've fortunately been, you know, had been, been able to stay away from. Um, I think that, you know, making sure that, you know, communicating our message and, and kind of like what we're doing today. I mean, Karen, are, Karen and I are on tour the next few days doing a lot of these discussions to make sure that not only you know the businesses understand you know what what we're trying to get the message we're trying to get out there but but the visitors to our community are trying to get out there um whether they're going to be visiting our beaches our restaurants our our shops um when we get to a you know these phases where we can open up communication is key and and um you know, we're using all the usual, you know, media and messaging outlets that we usually do, in, in, including the, the mayor's extended social media reach, uh, rave calls to our residents. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's a, lo a lot of things that'll be done uh, that, we, that we use our electric sign boards. We have um, signage all throughout the city. Uh, we'll have them at the beaches, at the parking lots. Restaurants will be required to have them in the reopening. So I think, you know, when you communicate well to people, whether they're visitors or residents, it's they they have a better understanding how to comply to the rules, and that's that's our hope is that we, if we can communicate it well, people will comply better. 
Jim, you were telling us that you had an important meeting yesterday with restaurant owners. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, it was a very interesting meeting. You know, when you get 35 or so restaurant owners in the same room who are, um, you know, all struggling through this in a different way. I mean, the restaurant business, as you know, is a big part of the Gloucester economy. The, you know, the eclectic dining taste in this community is what brings those visitors to this community. And um, so it was interesting to sit and talk about, you know, and, and I got to answer a lot of questions around best practices and, and, and things that we can do now before the reopening starts. I mean, we talked about not to get too far into the weeds, but I mean, we talked about, you know, your menus and how you, you know, how you should handle those. We talked about reservations and, you know, should everything go to reservations? A lot of conversations around, um, you know, PPEs. I mean, the availability of masks and gloves and is there going to be a shortage of that for businesses, um, you know, going forward when all these businesses start opening up and need these supplies? Um, there was, you know, uh, as Karen will tell you, we've got a lot of uh, comments on our um you know, email around um, outdoor dining, maybe making Main Street, I'm sure you've heard that too, maybe making Main Street a pedestrian friendly and allowing the, um, the you know, the restaurants on Main Street at least to, to move out into uh, Main Street with some outside dining. Uh, there's legislation moving forward right now, I believe, um, to the ABCC is, is part of that procedure usually to relax that and the fees for that to throw so through these early phases they're going to allow that and give the local communities control to make that decision that would be a really good move for us i think but there's really you know low you know like no condiments no salt and pepper on the table the silverware has got to be rolled um you know there's a lot of things, you know, everybody's gonna make sure they serve safe updates, people are updated, and hopefully they'll even put a more of a streamlined process online so more people can be serve safe, uh, safe certified. But there are, you know, there's physical options. I know in my place, I put up plexiglass on my 17 foot counter, and it gave people, a, a, you know, another layer of confidence, both my staff and, you know, my customers who come in to see that there's another layer of protection there. It's clean, it looks good, and I actually like it. And I think people like it too. But there's also um, you know, administrative things that, that folks can do around flexible hours, about lower staffing, about you know, different ways, in, in, and it's gonna be very important to keep up the social distancing to the greatest extent possible in the restaurant business, which you know it isn't always easy. And you know, the hygiene protocols, and the training with your staff to understand what is expected. Um, my staff, we have meetings all the time about, you know, the doorknobs have to be cleaned. As soon as, the, you know, if there's not a customer in there, I want you out there cleaning the doorknobs, cleaning anything that anybody's touching. I mean, it's, you know, it's incumbent upon all of us as business owners, residents, and visitors to, to help this, the, you know, you know, the, the, to not spread this virus. This virus is still out there and it's dangerous. And we gotta do everything we can as a community, as a business community, and as visitors to, to do what we can to stop it. And Karen, do you wanna to reiterate to the public what you need from us to do to, to keep flattening this curve and working together? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to all just kind of remember we still today are under a stay at home advisory. Um, we, we still need to practice, like Jim said, I mean, all the same things that businesses are going to do hand washing 20 seconds or more um, careful with surfaces that you touch cover your face if you can't social distance. Um, again, the highest risk and, and kind of focusing on the highest risk. But so when you're outside, there's very little chance of transmission, especially if you're keeping six feet away. Um, so it's when you go inside places, businesses, restaurants, shops, um, other people's homes, that's where the risk will go up. Um, and when you are with someone within six feet for more than 10 to 15 minutes. So it's about people being educated, managing the risk. And the best thing we can all do is wear that covering, face covering when you're out and about. It's going, it's, studies show it really significantly can reduce the numbers of transmission. So if you're in a close space with someone inside or out, make sure you have your face covering on. 
Um, but again, just the less you, you know, the, the less you can go out and about, it's, it's still a good thing. It pretty much try to keep, keep away is we're still not in this place where we want to all be going out and about everywhere. Um, and again, remembering our most at risk residents, our seniors, um, we are looking at special programs within each of these subcategories for seniors. How can we get them out to enjoy the parks, the beaches, the restaurants, the food that's available, the farmers markets? So, you know, we're really trying to focus on them. They are our highest risk, but so is social isolation. And, and that's a real concern, too. So we want to find ways they can safely get out. And that's going to require all of us remembering that face covering, washing our hands frequently. As Jim said, you know, in your home and out and about in your car, wiping down that steering wheel as much as you can. Um, so yeah, those are the main messages. Um, try to get out, enjoy the outdoors, but do it safely and separate from others as much as possible. Consider walking early in the morning or later in the evening if, if you like those times to avoid crowds on these nice days. Um, there's a lot of things a lot of us can do and we need to keep doing it to protect everyone and so that we can open and re and stay open. That's, that's the name of the game, that if we can all just manage the symptoms, stay away if we have them, protect others, hopefully we can open slowly and stay open. That's what we want to do here. Um, and that's in all of our best interests. So yeah, I think we know what we need to do. <laughs> Got to keep doing it. Karen, I want to know what the safest youth sport is. The safest sports are um, sailing, um, golf, tennis, and then baseball is kind of um, pretty pretty good too. Um, again, contact. We you know the less contact you have, the better. Indoor sports not so great right now. No basketball, hockey, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so they kind of graduate, but again, our, our students, we've done a lot of research, they found some great stuff from soccer in Italy. There's ways you can modify any activity to be safer, like golf, you know, we found ways, um, again, that's a low impact, but yeah, I mean, these, hopefully we can get kids back out there doing their thing too, in a slightly modified way. When you're sitting on the bench waiting to bat, you're going to have a face covering on, but you know, we're hoping that if we clean those bats and balls regularly and hand sanitize, um, kids can get back out and play baseball pretty soon. Yeah. Well, that's good news. Corey, anything else? No, I mean, the 18th is a big day, and we really appreciate all the work that Jim and Karen, all the city officials uh, have been putting into this. Uh, every, each topic is so complicated. Uh, and so we thank you for, uh, for getting into that a little bit with us today. And we hope to follow up, try to get some rest if you can. We know you probably have 20 more of these Zooms going on today. Uh, but we appreciate your time and I uh, look forward to uh, chatting with you soon. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.